So thanks for joining us today for December in your garden. Um, oh, and I put November. <laughs> I started working on this a couple of days ago and I put November, but this is December, December in your garden, December 1st. Um, and let's see what we're up to this year. So <clears throat> for December in the garden, um, I always like to put a little bit of context to where we are weather-wise. And there's a website you can go to if you'd like a link to it. It's on a resource sheet that I'll show you at the end. Um, but you can go and see where we are drought-wise. So you have a couple different things going on. You have the different colors, you know, white being no drought all the way to dark red, which is exceptional drought. So you have those different colors. You can see that we are in San Bernardino County. We are eh, roughly speaking about like that. So this is our little part of the county over here. Um, and you can see that we're in severe, maybe the lower parts of the county are in moderate drought. But the other thing, and I didn't actually notice it until today that makes this uh, website cool or interesting, is that they also have, in, in addition to the intensity of the drought, they also have information about how long um, these impacts are going to be felt. And so you have short-term impact, short impacts, long-term, and short and long-term. And you can see in Southern California, California area, that most of these drought impacts are long. I like to start December in the Garden this year with that because as the weather's gotten cooler, as we've had a couple of pretty uh, decent storms where I'm living, we got about four, four and a half inches of rain the last um, uh, storm that we got. But if you think back to December, right into the new year of 2021, 22, oh we had a really big storm then too. And we were thinking we would have a wet winter and it turned out to be exceptionally dry. There's been impacts on uh, citrus, uh, citrus, on uh, Christmas trees, I noticed that if you go, there's a nursery that is near me who's not going to sell Christmas trees this year, and it was due to the extended impact of the drought. And I don't think it was the drought conditions per se, but may, perhaps more the water restrictions associated with drought. Another thing that I've noticed that's kind of been tied to the drought is that trees that really suffered. When did we have that heat wave? That heat wave was in like. September, right? Like the first part of September, we had that really extended heat wave. And while some years, I think it was 2018 that we had um, weather that was, um, you know, in some areas like in San Bernardino was 118 degrees. It was really hot, but it wasn't such a long lasting heat. So in September, we had that really long, maybe seven or nine days, a really long period of heat. And so I'm noticing that I do have some dieback. We'll talk about that a little bit. But a lot of your our plants are kind of uh, been either slow to recover or we're, you know, seeing those symptoms of things that normally would come back in the fall, like a perennial plant, those things not coming back. So we're really coming into December very dry. I've also been doing some native plant plantings and... We haven't gotten enough rain. I live on the west end of San Bernardino County near Pomona, and we haven't gotten enough rain that those plants haven't needed supplemental water. I would like to, well, we'll talk about native plants in just a little bit. So pretty much December, we've had, I believe, although I need to look this up, I would say cooler, maybe not cooler than average, but cooler temperatures. A lot of times our summers feel like they go right up to Christmas. We definitely, or till the end of the year, we definitely in October had a, a, a prominent cooling and have had um, pretty, pretty cool temperatures. And, but we'll look more at the lower temperatures in just a little bit with the chill hours. But so not so hot, which is a bonus, uh, but very dry, very dry. So that's kind of where we are in our December. Although, you know, there's been some years, you know, it's December 1st. And there's been some years where cool season vegetables that we'll talk more about in a little bit were it was kind of there would be uh, hot or warm spells where we were having to worry about things that were planted in October might be going to flower too soon or things that were small plants um, struggling under the heat, at least uh, for San Bernardino County. That's not where we are this year. 
we're having um, some really nice cool temperatures and maybe the concern would be more in the direction of frost. In December, we're not always worried about frost. February is usually the coolest time of the year. And since I've been with the Master Gardener program for five or six years, um, I would say most of those years, we haven't been worried about frost in December, um, but uh, a couple of years, but most of the years it's been fairly warm. So that's our December. So for planting in your garden now, um, it's cool season veggie time. It is native plant and flower time. We'll talk more about that in a minute. It's a great time to plant ornamental trees that are not frost sensitive. If you are listening to this presentation from outside of the county, you've got to sort of make adjustments for your region on the coastal areas. You're going to have a little bit more of probably some milder temperatures. I don't know about the moisture you've been getting or the offshore moisture that you've been getting, but um, if you are living in the mountains or cooler parts of the high desert, you're probably going to be thinking about some frost protection. And it's always a good idea. I like to have shade cloth or shade kind of identify my vulnerable plants. When it's in June, I start thinking about, okay, if I've got tomatoes, you know, what's my plan if we have a quick onset of hot weather? And around November, I usually start thinking about, okay, what's my plan for uh, a cold snap if I have young plants that are sensitive? So just sort of thinking about logistics, if I was going to be putting up frost cloth or shade cloth, do I have young trees that I might need to put a structure on? Just thinking about things like that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So for edibles that you can plant now, um, to eat through the winter. And so the cool season veggie time is usually about October to May. And cool season veggies are veggies that thrive. They do well with the shorter days. A lot of times they're plants where we eat stems, roots, bulbs, um, immature flowers. And a lot of that kind of growth, you know, that's the vegetative growth of a plant usually. A lot of that growth goes quicker in the summer. And so broccoli, for example, while you can, I've seen many people grow broccoli year round. Um, it often goes to flower very quickly in the summer and it's a lot tougher stems. In the summertime, we're usually eating fruits, things that go to flower and then make a fruit. So when I try to think about if a plant is a cool season or a warm season veggie, a lot of times I like to divide it in if I'm eating the fruit of the plant, which means that it's the part with seeds, then it's a warm season veggie. And if I'm eating a stem, an immature flower head, a leaf, a modified stem, a root, then it's probably a cool season veggie. There's some crossover and in the Inland Empire, uh, I've seen people grow definite cool season veggies in the summer, a little bit less success with warm season veggies in the winter. A lot of times warm season veggies are less cold tolerant and they need to go through all of their vegetative growth. Plus they need to make fruits. One of the things that we always get questions about in the winter time is about growing tomatoes. A lot of times the um, stores will have seeds on sale and they'll have tomato seeds or whatever. And so if you have a smaller tomato, like a cherry tomato, especially one like the they call it sweet millions, whatever it's called, but like a smaller cherry tomato. Some of those will get ripe, but usually you'll find those fruits will be mealy. The texture won't be right. And so they're needing those longer days. Some of them need warmer soil. So our October through May season is the time when we're growing plants that we probably don't want to let them go to flower unless we're harvesting seeds that we're eating those leaves, those stems, those immature flowers. So and I forgot to add what the asterisk is here. But so here's some cool season veggies. And these ones are a little bit longer to harvest and you usually only get one, maybe two crops in the winter. I do, you know, I don't do as much cool season veggie gardening, but definitely in looking at who the cast of characters are for cool season veggies, they're usually a lot more nutritious than warm season veggies. Warm season veggies, you get more color variety. 
and maybe more antioxidants and things like that. Um, but those, these cool season veggies are very nutritious and there's a lot of purple ones and, and some color in the cool season veggies as well. So beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, those are all ones that are in the brassica family. These ones you can usually get one season, maybe two, but let me finish the list and I'll go back to the ones with the asterisk. Celery and onions, garlic can be planted, peas, your Swiss chard, your turnips, and many of your herbs. A lot of the herbs in Southern California, this is probably not true if you live in the mountains unless you bring them inside or you have a cold frame or a hot house, something like that. <clears throat> They're probably not perennials, but a lot of the herbs, in fact, probably most of them are perennial in Southern California. Cilantro is one that won't stand the real cold weather and it won't stand the real hot weather. Basil is one. I've overwintered a lot of basil, but it doesn't produce a great crop. A lot of the herbs will produce their best crop in the spring and the fall, but they can be carried through both the winter and into the summer. So looking at the ones with an asterisk, the beets and broccoli and cabbage and peas, these are ones that you can probably plant a couple of crops. So looking at broccoli, if you planted broccoli in like October or November, it's going to be ready the first part of the year. And you can probably get a second crop of broccoli in no later than February, maybe March, and you want it to get harvested or ready before May. If we have a warm spring, sometimes that foils that plan. But cabbage as well. Actually, I should have put an asterisk next to cauliflower. Um, peas, some of the peas are going to be vining peas that are going to produce until the weather is not um, until it gets too warm uh, but some peas like bush peas and this is the same with beans the bush peas will sort of produce one crop or a couple you know produce for a month or so and be done and with those you might want to plant a couple of times onions and garlic do best when planted i would say like in southern california the ideal time is uh, <clears throat> October, late October through November. And you could probably still plant onions and garlic if you haven't already, but those are gonna bulb up in the spring. So whatever you plant now, sometimes you can do a second crop of onions in the spring, but garlic, if you plant them in the spring, it's probably gonna be too late. Brussels sprouts, they do like to be planted in warm soil. And so, and they also don't like it when it's too dry. Even though we've had cold weather and a couple of good rains, it's actually been relatively dry. I noticed that a lot of my potted plants have been drying in between the rain and I've had to do some, um, and that's always an adjustment for us. You know, as humans, I feel like in the winter time, I'm not nearly as good at drinking enough water and I get dehydrated more often because I'm just not thinking about it. Um, and the plants are getting dry as well. The Brussels sprouts like more coastal region with a little bit more humidity, but we can grow Brussels sprouts and they do best when planted into warm soil. So planting Brussels sprouts now may be a little bit of a challenge unless you can do something to warm that soil or it's near the house or you live in a warmer area. So Brussels sprouts, onions and garlic, probably if they're not planted now, either plant them now, like right away, or it's probably a little bit too late. For your celery, the celery is kind of usually one per season. So these are the things, the edibles that you can plant now, and kind of whether you can plant a couple of times in the cool season, which is usually about October to May. And what ruins the cool season, the quote unquote cool season, is going to be unseasonably warm falls, that might cause things like broccoli to go to flower early or cabbage to go to flower early, maybe too hot for peas as they're starting out. And the other thing that sort of ruins a cool season would be an early spring. So if you planted a broccoli in January or February and we had quite warm weather in March, it would be the same thing where the broccoli would go to flower before it really made a nice broccoli head or the cabbage as well. Um, so those are just th things to think about. The other things that you can plant about October to May-ish, again, depending on, you know, our season. Right now we're kind of in 
I would say kind of in the end of the beginning of our cool season planting time. So I kind of divide it into two sections. And I kind of think about it like October through January, we're sort of entering into the cool season. You can be planting a lot of these. Um, and some of these also take, you know, 130, 150, well, like 120, 130 days to ripen. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of that opportunity. And then in February, again, it's usually our coolest time of the year, but you could be starting several of these again. For these plants that take a little bit less time to ripen, or they do, they're a little more tolerant of the warm weather, then maybe it wouldn't be two times through the winter season, um, but it would maybe be three or four times. The time to be really mindful of, and as every month we do a month in the garden presentation, so we'll talk more about this as we get into January. But if you are planting young plants around February, then sometimes we can have some quite cold weather that can even a cool season plant, it's just too cold for them. So collards, chives, endives, favas, kale, kohlrabi, leeks, lettuce, um, radishes, rutabaga, spinach, carrots, mustard, parsley, and parsnips are all things that you can plant um, maybe a couple times in the cool season, maybe two or three times. Chives, lettuce, radish, carrots, and parsley, and spinach in a lot of Southern California can be planted year round. Radish, radishes, will struggle if they get too warm in the summer, carrots as well, but I know a lot of people who grow those year round. So these are these are your list of vegetables to plant. You've got these here and um, I can put this, I'll show you where our resources are. I'll put this presentation on our website. Um, things to plant for next spring. I already mentioned onions and garlic, but so, you know, a lettuce, if you planted it in November and you start getting leaves and December, you could be harvesting off that lettuce for several months, or you could be planting, you know, four or five crops of lettuce, but the things to be planting now for next spring, and most of these things, well, like onions and garlic, probably the ideal time is the end of no <laughs> end of October, kind of through now, if you haven't, and if you haven't gotten onions or garlic yet, then you're running out of time. Um, if you're purchasing them online, they may be out already. Onions, if you can't find them, um, you can't take like an onion from the store and plant it. It will make a stem and a flower stalk, but it won't make a good bulb. The bulb will be kind of depleted from sending out that flower stalk. So if you couldn't find any other onions and you really wanted to plant onions, your last chance right now would be probably seeds. For garlic, you can plant garlic um, from cloves that you get at the store, but there's a lot of variables there. You don't know what kind of garlic it is. If it has a, a stem in the center, it's called a hardneck garlic. Those garlics usually don't do quite as well in Southern California. They need a little bit cooler weather. Maybe they would do better up in the higher altitudes. So you would want the what they call a soft neck garlic. And so if you buy a garlic from the store and you take the cloves apart, and especially, I think we've all had it sort of uh, send out a stem in our kitchen if we leave it a little bit too long, and it doesn't have that hard stem in the center, then that's a soft neck garlic, and that would be a good option, and you could plant those now for next year. Um, and then for onions in Southern California, we want to get a short day onion. Strawberries, anytime from October through now, great time to plant strawberries. They're going to start to go dormant. But what they're doing is they're growing underground and they're sending out some really good roots so that next summer, next early, next, you know, late spring, they can start or, you know, in February, they'll start sending out flowers and they'll make you a good fruit crop in the, uh, the summer. So strawberries that get planted this time of year usually do better than strawberries that are planted in the spring. If you have a strawberry patch and you have your strawberries are sending out runners with those baby plants. Usually strawberries, you only get two or three seasons per strawberry plant. So if you've had your strawberries in the ground for a year or two, and it's sending out runner plants, you might wanna cut those runner plants from the plant and plant those. If you've just planted your strawberries for the first time this year, 
you want to cut off those runner plants and probably discard them or give them away because they're taking away energy from your strawberries. Your cane berries, they could be planted now. They're going to be going dormant. Um, mine are still a little bit green, but they're going to be starting to go dormant. It's probably a little bit too early. I mean, you could plant them now, but um, a lot of times you'll see them coming into the garden centers around the end of the year and in January. Blueberries as well. You'll be seeing those coming in uh, end of the year into January. Um, deciduous fruit trees, those are the ones that lose their leaves, apricots and cherries and whatnot. You'll be seeing those come in at the end of the year in January. So these will, these will be things we'll be planting for next year or future years. Artichokes as well, if you can find them. And asparagus will be uh, coming soon. It's a little bit early for asparagus, but have that on your radar. And especially for these things where the timing of the planting is a little bit more, um, I don't know, I've had a harder time. Onions and garlic, I always think about onions and garlic in like January, and it's too late. So I've trained my brain. Finally, this year, I was thinking about onions and garlic in September, and I ordered some and had some uh, ready. I didn't plan a lot, but at least I was on top of it. Strawberries, I'm usually thinking when they first start coming into um, season in the summer, I'm like, ooh, strawberries, but this is the time to be planting them. Same with your canes, uh, berries, and your blueberries. Deciduous fruit trees, it's all about January, and your artichokes and asparagus you could be planting as well. Edibles that you don't want to plant now are um, frost-sensitive herbs, uh, cilantro, depending on how much protection you can provide, and I have a few pictures at the end. Frost sensitive herbs can um, be a challenge, especially if you live at higher elevations. Citrus and avocados, while they don't go dormant, and I guarantee you can go to a garden center today and purchase a citrus or an avocado, purchasing them right now, it's gonna be the most challenging for you in the sense that they're getting ready. They've just kind of flushed out for the fall. They sent out their new growth and they're gonna be really susceptible to any kind of frost conditions. So I would hold off. If you really wanna buy a citrus or an avocado or another subtropical plant, then just have your frost protection plan in place. Um, and then your warm season veggies. We've already talked about uh, warm season veggies not being appropriate. They don't um, usually have long enough hours in the day to produce nice fruit. The soil is often too cool, and um, still it's a question, one of our most frequently asked questions is about planting. A lot of people like to start gardening with planting tomatoes, and this is just not the time of year where you're going to have the most success. Now, if you have a greenhouse or you like a challenge, you know, there's always exceptions, but these are just my recommendations. And the other thing with uh, frost-sensitive herbs warm season fruits and veggies, citrus and avocados, is they can be difficult to find. But on the flip side, there are so many nurseries and garden centers, and it makes sense. They buy stuff in the summer, they want to sell it, and so they discount it. And um, it's a great time to find, right now, it's a great time to find off-season things at half price. So again, if you like a challenge, and you're like a bargain, you can often find me at the um, you know dollar plant rack at the garden center uh, because I'm trying to rescue geraniums that look shabby, but I know they'll be good next year. So I'm not saying not to buy them. Just keep these things in mind. For your ornamentals, it's a good time for camellias and azaleas. Our bare root roses are gonna start showing up in the nurseries this month. Um, you wanna shop while selections are good. Um, you can choose a living Christmas tree and keep it outside until Christmas week. Even if you're not a person who celebrates Christmas, there's a lot of great um, pine and conifer trees. So even if that's not your thing, then it's uh, still a great time to find them. Um, and also, like, if you are buying some, uh, you know, pine or, or winter holiday type trees, definitely read the labels there's been some I've seen at my local grocery stores. I'm like, oh, this is so cute. And when I read a little bit more about the label, I realize it's really not the right plant uh, for my area. So just keep that in mind. Um, for your ornamentals not to plant. Oh, whoops. 
Okay, disregard that first part. Sorry about that. The ornamental is not to plant right now. You don't want to plant anything that's going to be frost sensitive. So anything that's going to be frost sensitive, especially I like some more, some of the flowers that I like are a little bit more tender. Um, pineapple sage is one I like to plant. It's a great plant to plant in the fall. It's an okay plant to plant in the winter. It's going to start slowing down a little bit. So sometimes it's a little bit harder to plant this time of year. So you're going to want to be careful about frost sensitive plants right now. Things you can continue to plant are tulips, narcissus, daffodils, and hyacinths to have a longer bloom of show in the spring. Great. Um, I've had a lot of luck with buying daffodils and narcissus at the end of the year bulb sales. Um, and so some I have that have been in the ground for several years and they start to come up earlier. And then when I buy bulbs at the end of the season, then they come up a little bit later. And then if you have uh, interest in bringing in poinsettia, po poinsettias, amaryllis, calendulas, Iceland poppies, pansies, Christmas cactus, and primroses, they'll definitely brighten the holidays with some color. You just want to be careful too. I used to always get poinsettias and I have a cat that loves to eat plants and apparently they're poisonous. So just keep that in mind if you're bringing plants inside. Um, for your native plants, this is a great time to plant your plants. And so I'm doing most of my, I'm focusing on planting my native plants this year in the fall and kind of right at the end of the fall. I know we're getting close to the shortest day of the year, but since our coldest day of the year or days of the year are usually in February, then um, we're kind of right at the beginning of our cooler winter season. Um, so I'm trying to plant now, hoping that we get enough rain that they get a little better established. Last year, I planted a lot of native plants in March, and then we had a really, really dry spring. And so they really didn't establish, and I had to do a lot of summer watering. A lot of the botanical gardens, I live near the California Botanic Gardens, and they are posting all about how they are planting their wildflower seeds now before the rain. So if you have any wildflower seeds on hand and we've got this rain coming up, get those wildflower seeds out there. If we do have, uh, you know, like we had rain, what, two weeks ago-ish? And then we're having rain now. I've had to water my new plants twice um, just because they've started to have curling leaves and they're definitely showing symptoms of drying out. When you plant native plants, as we get, like if you plant native plants in the summer, like May, then as the weather starts to heat up, the plants will show symptoms of drying, but it's also tied to the fact or the, that they go into like a summer dormancy. So the way that they survive our hot summers is sort of by going dormant, they'll die back a little bit. And so establishing native plants in the summer can be kind of tricky because they'll kind of go into a dormancy, which makes it really easy to overwater them, oddly enough. This time of year, especially with the kind of uh, late heat that we had in September, I noticed a lot of the native plants leafed out a little bit later than they normally would. Um, but my native plants are leafing out. The leaves are nice and green. There's a lot of new growth. So if I'm seeing leaves curling this time of year, I know that that curling is caused by a watering issue. And I check my soil too before I water. You might want to think about cover crops. Cover crops are if you're not going to do a cool season veggie garden, but you have cool or you have uh, vegetable beds or um, even potted plants, you know, normally cover crops, we think about improving soil health. And so maybe in a pot, you might not be um, trying to improve that soil. If you keep, if you like, I do a lot of my veggie gardening in pots because I have a lot of pests in the garden, uh, gophers and stuff. And so before I plant a different season, you know, if I'm transitioning from warm season to cool season or cool season to warm season, I usually completely dump out that pot if it's not too heavy, mix in some compost and sort of improve the soil. So adding things like a nitrogen fixing plant and bringing that nitrogen in is probably a little bit less important than if you're planting in ground. So if you're planting in ground, 
the cover crops help improve the conditions in the soil since you're not dumping that soil exactly. And so some cover crops are things like I said, the nitrogen fixing legumes, um, which will uh, put nitrogen back into the soil. And then other, and those, those you let them go through these, this is an example of a really pretty one, but you would let it go through and you could let it flower. It becomes a pollinator plant. A lot of the fava beans are great for that. And then other cover crops are ones that you let grow. A lot of that's the clovers and grasses, or um, I think vetch as well, which I think is a grass. Um, but those plants, you let them grow. And before they go to seed, you will cut them down. And what improves the soil is you turning in those four to six inches plants, uh, mixing them into the soil. So you're improving soil structure. You may be bringing nitrogen in through nitrogen fixing bacteria. Maybe you're bringing nitrogen in by folding those uh, several inch tall plants into the soil. But if you are gardening in pots or even if you're gardening in the ground, cover crops can also do a lot to bring in pollinators. So this is uh, the front of my house and all of this is alyssum. Alyssum is not a native plant. It's in the brassica family. Um, which can be really invasive. Mustard is in the brassica family, but this uh, alyssum doesn't seem to be invasive in wild areas. It reseeds really well. In my area, once I have it established, it comes back. I didn't plant any of this. This all came back, and this covers about a third of an acre in the spring and the fall. But what's really great about this is one, it outcompetes other weeds like those goat's heads or other thorns that I don't want in the garden, but it also is a great food source for surf and fly adults and other pollinators who are feeding on nectar. So a lot of times when I'll go out into my front orchard, I will hear um, little buzz of bugs and there will be a lot of pollinators in this. So pollen uh, cover crops can help improve soil. They can also be a food source for pollinators. So definitely something to think about when you're um, planning uh, what to do with open spaces, especially if you think about like in the winter time, since we are getting some rain, you know, even if you stop watering your garden, you're probably going to get some weeds. So if you're getting some weeds, consider a cover crop. There is a website. <clears throat> there was a question in the chat about what other cover crops um, that would be recommended. And there is a website. Let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Um, and it's with an uh, NRCS in Cal Flora. It's called the E-Veg Guide. And this is a really cool website. And so it's the NRCS E-Veg Guide. Let's see if I can remember my password. And it, um, let's see. Yes, I can. So if you, they don't send you spam emails. I've never gotten spam emails, but they do make you create an account if you want this information. So I can take the map and I can drop a pin on my approximate location. And with that, it will tell me information if you click on climate and soil profile. It is important to remember that this information is for the native soil, so the soil pH. And the salinity might be different if you live in a newer home where the soil's been backfilled. But another thing that you can get <clears throat> from this is you can get information about cover crops. So if you click on search criteria and you click on practice, and this is a really cool website. I really love it because you can also do like conservation cover. Um, and this is also for reforesting. This is a lot of times used for uh, government or non-government agencies who are working in wild areas. Um, but so if you were to, for example, choose cover crop, but you could also choose a wind barrier. You can also uh, um, choose, um, uh, you know, there was one other uh, wildlife habitat planting. But so if we were to choose cover crop, for example, and then we could do like a cereal grain <clears throat> or a grass, those are ones for the cover crops. You know, they have trees and shrub, shrubs for like the wind breaks. But so for a cereal or a grass, those are ones you would cut in, probably a forb as well. You would cut them in 
And you can reach out to the Master Gardener helpline if you wanted to know, because just because something is a quote unquote, it took me embarrassingly, well, not embarrassingly, it takes us time to learn things. I didn't realize right away that there was different uses of the cover crops and some are cut in like the grasses, you would cut them in before they go to seed because they can become a little bit invasive in your yard. Whereas a legume, you wouldn't want to let it go for as long as possible. So if we chose a cover crop and legume, and we wanted that legume to be a pollinator habitat, and we wanted it to be a native for purpose, you know, increase organics, capture nutrients, nitrogen fixation, which is what you would get out of a legume. And then I put search. Um, then these are and it's a pretty limited search window, but I could, uh, you know, so you could broaden it. But a small flowered lupin, American bird's foot trefoil, a royal lupin, and tomcat clover are ones that are in the legume family. They're pollinator habitats, and they're native to my area. Um, and then you can research a little bit more, or with this list, if you have questions, you could reach out to the Master Gardener Helpline. So that's a really cool tool for more information about cover yeah, crops. And so for maintaining your garden, then, oh, I didn't finish this slide either. I got, I got sort of carried away with something else on the presentation. And so for maintaining, I have it all broken down here though. Um, for maintaining your edible plants, uh, you're gonna be planting the cool season veggies that we talked about earlier. You're gonna be pulling out old warm season veggies. Most of those warm season veggies even though they might not die during the cool season, one of the things that they do is they allow pests from your warm season to overwinter and to get into your cool season crops. So I recommend you probably pull those unless they're perennial plants, like the small chili peppers or an artichoke or something like that. You're gonna be checking for pests. Watering is easier in some sense because it's cooler, but it also can be tricky because you need to watch out that it's not getting dry without you realizing it. Especially if you think about your garden, I try to remind myself, you know, we talk about hydrozoning where you keep plants of the same type together. So if a plant was a low water use plant, we put it together. If it's a medium water use plant, we put it together. Vegetables are very high water use. We would put those together, but there's another layer of category that you need to remember or that I have to remember in my garden, which is I may have low water use native plants, but when I plant a new plant, for a time it becomes a high water use plant. So especially right now, if you're planting seeds, then those are going to be higher water use plants. And some of your established plants, maybe they can go from one rain to the next rain and they'll be okay because it's not that hot. But your cooler or your smaller plants, which are newly planted, they don't have as much of a root network and they're not going to be as hardy. So again, some ways it's easier to um, water because you're not watering as often. There's not as much heat to deal with. Our winters, though, can be very dry and it can be easy to forget to water. So just keep those things in mind. You could be planning your uh, uh, warm season extravaganza, your warm season veggies, um, it will be February before you know it, and that's a great time to start planting your warm season veggies. If you're going to be doing any seed saving in your cool season garden, you might want to be thinking about spacing, maybe thinking about focusing on one or two types of plants. Some of your cool season veggies can be very easy to seed save from, like peas and lettuce, or they can be very challenging, like broccoli. So check out our seed saving presentations, reach out to our helpline if you have questions. And then if you haven't done any soil enriching, then you can do that now. You can be planting cover crops, you can be adding compost. The one thing to keep in mind this time of year is to be watching for when we've had a lot of rain that you're not doing a lot of uh, walking around close to your tree roots in your raised beds because you're compacting that soil. For your fruit tree maintenance, um, for your deciduous trees, which is going to be your stone and your palm fruits, it's going to be time to plant your bare root trees at the end of the year and in January. When the leaves drop, you can spray a dormant oil spray and do your pruning in January. Except for cherries and apricots, you're going to do the same as above with the dormant oil spray or planting in January but your pruning will happen in August. They're susceptible to a, 
fungus or a blight. And for your citrus, I mean, for your subtropicals and your avocados, then we'll talk about maintenance of that in just a second. For your um, citrus and avocados, we'll talk about fertilizer as well in just a second. And then we do, during this time of year, we do several, several longer fruit tree talks. So check our website for that and um, be on the lookout for those fruit tree talks. And if you're not familiar, the stone fruits are the ones with the pits and the palm fruits are the ones when you cut them in a cross section, they have kind of a star pattern. For your citrus, you definitely wanna cut back on water. A lot of people overwater their citrus in the winter time. They still need water, but they don't need nearly as much. We'll talk about flush in just a minute. And then for pruning, maybe you're removing things that are dead or diseased any water sprouts or suckers or anything that died back in the summer. A little bit late to fertilize your citrus, um, so I would probably hold off and do it in the spring um, because if they're sending out the new growth, which looks like this, then the new growth can be prone to freezing. Um, I might fertilize, oh, it's awfully late. I'm probably gonna wait until February. So if you haven't done it by now, probably good to wait till February. Avocados, um, again, you would just sort of be doing like a mild pruning. You don't want to do any heavy pruning because if it gets really cold, they're really susceptible to frost. This is what these rootstock suckers look like. And this is what the water sprouts when we have a big rain like we had a few weeks ago. Sometimes citrus will send out these long spindly growth and you want to cut those back. Even if they do make fruit, these ones usually won't make an edible fruit. But these ones will, but they're usually not very strong. For your ornamental plants, you just want to keep your poinsettias in a sunny, warm location. Feed them monthly. Water them thoroughly, but don't overwater them. A lot of people kill their poinsettias with overwatering, especially in the, if they're in that colorful cellophane mylar um, wrap, then it's easy to overwater them. And then if you have any holiday greens that you want to prune for, holiday, holly, juniper, Pittosporum and more, then it's a great way to use to decorate for holidays. I know it's six o'clock, I'll wrap up in just a second, or five o'clock, sorry, wrap up in just a second. Um, for your ornamental fruit trees, you want to make sure that if you have any new, not fruit trees, sorry, your ornamental trees, you want to make sure that your new trees get enough water and that as they're getting established, they're not getting dry. If there's any dieback from the summer, you want to cut that out or any diseased wood. And if you have any young trees, you might need to prepare for frost protection. And then it's a great time to mulch. If you're mulching trees, you can do three to four inches of mulch. And you want that about four to six inches away from the trunk of your tree so that pests are not getting in to the base of the tree. In the East Coast, they do sort of this volcano mulching, but they get a lot colder weather than we do. If you have a lawn, I would say turn off your automatic sprinklers. There's a lot of smart sprinklers now that um, you know they um, can sense the rain and the moisture and the temperature and all that stuff. And so maybe you have, if you have those, you probably don't need to worry about that. But if you don't, then just be watching the rain and turning off those automatic sprinklers. You wanna watch for the darn mosquitoes. Usually this time of year, it's really cold for the mosquitoes. But as soon as we have that little bit of warm weather after that rain, those tiger mosquitoes with the white and black striped legs they were out again and they don't need very much water at all. For your native plants, as you're planting now, then they probably need some watering in to get established. If you have native plants that are several years old, then you really probably don't need to do much watering. They'll probably be okay. You may wanna, I like to wait till this time of year. Usually it's in November. When they start to leap out, I can tell what just went dormant and what really did die back. And so now I'm sort of doing some shaping, kind of giving a haircut to those. Uh, they usually don't need mulch and don't necessarily do well with mulch and they don't do well with fertilizer. Just a few more things. Um, you can want to think about raking up leaves just to control pests and diseases. We'll talk about that again in just a second. Cleaning up your garden beds. Be on the lookout for frost. Um, prune uh, your non-flowering trees and shrubs while they're dormant. Um, and cleaning up debris or debris around fruit trees to present, prevent diseases. You could uh, mulch, water, and cover tender plants to protect from frost. 
your onions, your garlic, especially might like some mulch if we get cold weather and your strawberries as well. Uh, make sure you remove the covering during the day so that pests or moisture doesn't build up in there. And then if you have any um, uh, bird baths or anything, you want to keep those clean. And so another thing to consider, you know, you want to have your garden tidy, but I always like to leave some areas with some leaves for native bees or other insects that I want in the garden. Although now the mosquitoes like to lay their eggs in the moisture on the underside of a leaf, which is really challenging. So try to balance that out. This time of year, if you have basins that you've created around fruit trees or other plants, um, they may start to fill up when we get a heavy rain. So if I have like a berm that I've created, I'll make like a little uh, cut in there to make sure that water's draining and not sitting around there. For your fertilizer, since it's getting late, I won't go too much into the fertilizer, but basically for the fertilizer, you have your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. Whether you're using an organic or a conventional fertilizer, usually an all-purpose fertilizer will do the trick. If something says it needs fertilizer for root growth, that's that middle number, the phosphorus. And um, we're gonna skip over this acidity chart. There is some information and I will be putting this presentation in the and the um, resources on our website. But if you are planting blueberries or azaleas or something, or you have them and they're showing symptoms of iron deficiency, the reason those plants are called acid loving plants is that iron, as the pH gets too high, and our native soil is between seven and eight, and most potting soil is about six, six and a half, um, but iron becomes less available. So these quote unquote acid loving plants, they start, to, they start to show iron deficiency because iron is much more available at lower pHs. So if you do have those iron deficiency symptoms, then there's a couple of ways you can acidify your soil and these two resources are really great. You can apply chelated iron to azaleas, gardenias, and camellias if the leaves are yellowing between the veins. That's those iron deficiency symptoms. And so you're basically applying iron because the pH is a little bit high probably, and the iron is just not as available. Um, and there's lots of different takes on how to manage that. Reach out to our helpline if you have more questions. Your an annual flowers can be fed with a complete fish, uh, complete fertilizer. Your vegetables that are growing strong can be fertilized about every six weeks or so. If you have plants in pots, we apply less fertilizer so we don't burn the plants, but because we're applying less, we also apply it a little bit more often. And then you never want, if you have a dry plant, like the reason I didn't fertilize my citrus this fall was because it was dry and it needed food. And it's more important to get the water under control. They had gone through the summer kind of dry and I was worried about burning the plants with fertilizing them when they're dry. So when in doubt, get the watering under control and then fertilize. So I have been spending the later part of the fall getting my watering under control, kind of missed the window to fertilize because if they send out new growth in the end of December and the weather's cold, it's just gonna freeze those little leaves and the tree's wasting its energy. So I'll probably fertilize in the beginning of February. Here's a few shade structure ideas. This is actually planting into a straw bale, but straw, as long as you don't have a problem with uh, squirrels or whatever, getting into your straw, straw is a great way to keep things warm and also help keep snails and slugs away. I like these kind of floating row covers. So these are some ideas. Um, you can uh, do that dormant oil spray. And our January blog, if you aren't getting our newsletter, but we have a little section on pests and January is a good time to do dormant oil spray. And there will be information about that from us coming out the first part of January. So be on the lookout for that. And just a reminder that every effective insecticidal spray um, will impact everything that gets sprayed. So we just want to avoid spraying trees and plants while they're in bloom and use least toxic methods. I love this website. This is what our master gardeners use statewide and a lot of people use. There's this great information. Earlier, we talked about the ants and this is where the ant information is from where they talk about least toxic methods of managing pests in the garden. 
because it's after five o'clock and we've already gone over our time, I'm not going to go too deep into chill hours. Um, and we're going to have on Saturday, we'll be in Muskoi. And from 11 to 1130 to one, we'll be doing a one and a half hour fruit tree presentation where we're going to talk all about this. We're also going to do one in Chino Hills at the library on January 7th where we'll talk about this for an hour and a half and we'll probably do one more online. So this is really important. If you are gonna be purchasing fruit trees before you get an opportunity to hear a presentation from us, um, maybe I'll put together a short YouTube video on this and um, just make sure you get fruit trees that are appropriate for your area. If you're in the Inland Empire, you're gonna to wanna to get low chill hour fruit trees. And you're want to want to get fruit trees that, and this would be low chill hour. They get between like 300 and 500 um, that need that. Blueberries are also plants that need chill hours, and kiwis are as well. So if you're doing any purchasing, I definitely noticed when I went to the garden center, there was blueberries for sale in my community that at a small garden center that required 700 chill hours. I would probably, I don't think we've gotten that ever, I'll probably have some years, but um, very infrequently. So I need a low chill hour blueberry that only needs like three to 400 chill hours. So if you have questions and you're gonna be purchasing fruit trees, I'm gonna skip through this. Um, this is just a chart. Um, cherries often need um, many more chill hours. If you live in the mountains, you get lots of chill hours. In the high desert, you get lots of chill hours. You have a little bit more op options, but you have a little bit more trouble growing the low chill hour fruit trees like persimmons, pomegranates, and figs. Um, the one thing I do want to share, if you don't get a chance to listen to a presentation, but you want to make sure you select a fruit tree that's appropriate for the area, Dave Wilson's Nursery, not endorsing them as a company, but they work a lot with universities and other researchers to create low chill hour varieties. So if you go to Dave Wilson's nursery and you search up apricots, then they have sort of like a menu and, and you can't purchase directly from their website. So Dave Wilson's nursery will sell to places like Home Depot, Lowe's, Armstrong's, mm -hmm. other garden centers like that. There are um, a uh, company that spend a lot of time developing fruit trees for Southern California that don't require as many chill hours. But if you go to their website, so you say you really want an apricot. I really wanted a plum. I wanted a green gauge plum. I went to their website. I found out green gauge plums need like 700 chill hours. Just not really appropriate for my area. Maybe I would get a fruit, a few fruit each year, but I'm not going to get a lot. So they're a great resource. Check out our upcoming presentations for seed saving. Check out the presentations that we've done Um in the past and you can find those on our YouTube channel and you can also check out upcoming presentations for harvesting now. Not a lot that you're harvesting now, but you'll be kind of planning. If you're doing um, flowers, then maybe those native sunflowers or some of your other garden flowers might be, you know, I, I actually have some native sunflowers which are going to seed, but it's totally off season and, and unexpected. So right now there's probably not a lot of seeds to be harvesting. Maybe you have some basil that has gone to flower and is seeded or something, but we're kind of in between the seed saving time, but check out our online seed saving classes. So what to get ready for? Roses in January, deciduous fruit trees in January, be prepared for frost, be on the lookout for rain that's either helpful or it's not enough. Sometimes we get rain and when you dig down a half an inch, it's hardly wet at all. So be on the lookout for a dry winter. What to enjoy this December? Our fall leaves, at least here in the Inland Empire, we're having some beautiful color and the native plants are coming back to life. We've got the pomegranates, the citrus, the persimmons are fruiting right now. Great time to plant cool season veggies, natives and more. One advantage to this time of year, often we have lower pest pressure and less need for water. So these are some resources that you can find on our website under recent presentations. And um, we have an upcoming workshop this Saturday at the Muskoi Library. You can find information about that at our website. At that um, workshop, then from uh, three to four, 
You can also, if you come at that time, you can get a free tree, either an ornamental or a fruit tree. Um, and so you can sign up on our website for that giveaway. Here's more information. I'll, um, well, I'll drop that in the chat. We don't have a big group, but I'll still drop that in the chat. So if you're listening to this as a recording, you can find that information on our website and sign up for our newsletter. And um, here's our newsletter information. You can find that sign up on our website as well. And here's our contact information. And so with that, I thank you guys for joining our December in the garden. We have a few more presentations this year. I'm excited next year to start a new gardening series called Peace and Pieces of the Garden and looking at sort of the more mental health aspects of gardening and how you can use your garden or a community garden or a, a green space in the area to promote your mental health. So be on the lookout for that. And in the spring, we'll start talking a lot more about pests which really take off as the season warms up and all of our plants are growing. So have a great day and thanks for joining.